Um, why you are so quiet and not, not so much responsive after the work? It's, maybe it's just okay, but I will, uh, I want to offer to, just to talk about, to understand why it is the case, just because you are thoughtful or uh, irritated or whatever. Rosemary what also... Ma- what are thoughts? Pardon? What, what are thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, I was really... Um I was really interested in mm-hmm. what you were doing. Well, I've worked with dreams before from a sort of perspective, but in a very different concept, in the concept of everything in the dream being a reflection of me. So even the cupboard, yes. what that is, yes. what part of me is the cupboard? Yes. Um, you know, what am I hiding? You know, what am I made of? Um, but what I found really useful was what you were doing is that I've used helicopter work as well mm-hmm. in recognising my own patterns of behaviour, mm-hmm. but never looked at it from the script, looking at a script or, or a play. Or, mm-hmm. So I, when you were working this morning, I found it really interesting, mm-hmm. a different side mm-hmm. in comparison to my own cupboard. Mm-hmm. Rosemary, one of the ideas she had is maybe uh, it's not done enough to connect it with organizational work. Hmm. That's quite what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Fun? Fun? I, I wonder if it's something around how we are in the room. Yes. Because I don't feel, and I've got the option to move, of course, but there's something about how we're, we're sitting and how we're organized. Yes. Where it's not geared towards group working as a group, perhaps. Yes. So I find myself more passive than I would normally do. If it's a fruitful passiveness, that's okay with me. I don't have <laughs> I don't have any problem with that. I just wanted to check with this is uh, underlying unsatisfaction and that we now we could change something. So. I guess for me, I'm, I'm finding the work is very different for me. So I'm yeah. finding I'm stretched and yeah. trying to make sense. Yes, you have problems um, to orient yourself. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so what I'm finding is, is, is what checking what questions do I want to ask and why. Yeah. Um, and actually, while I'm doing that, I guess I'm quiet. Mm-hmm. It's taking a bit of time to digest the process. Okay. For me, anyway. Personally. Yeah. It does feel very strange having the quietness without the dialogue in the group. Yeah. My experience is learning as much from others and their thoughts mm. and their struggles and their questions and their insights mm-hmm. and I value hearing people's struggles, questions, yeah. insights. Yeah. At our institute and in our programs this is the um, uh, most uh, preferred way to organize learning. Mm-hmm. And this seminar is different. I, my, my aim is uh, to give you an overview over 30 years of development. Mm-hmm. So. And we, that we have enough interactions that we stay alive <laughs> and some, somehow do not lose contact of listening. But the mode of taking in and thinking about and, and remembering and deciding what I uh, look at later, maybe again, or I, I would like to read on that, or this is not important for me. So this is what we can accomplish here. My sense from all, there's been lots shared from you in the room mm-hmm. in the last few days. My sense is I want to, I want to learn more about all of it. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, and I know that will take time and there are bits more than others. So I think my supervision with Rosemary <laughs> will oh. help me but later on understand if how to. If it's essential... Uh, uh, my personal experience was I have been one week with Norton Erickson and that touched my whole professional life. Mm-hmm. And I, I, he invited me to come back, but then he died. I would have come back, but it was not necessary. Mm-hmm. If your soul is touched and these are essentials, some are seeds who take one year mm-hmm. uh, to grow, but it's there. I, I, say, I always say the soul is measuring in quality, not in quantity. Mm-hmm. And concerning the organization, uh, um, 
unfortunately we the three conversations we we had did not offer too much really to relate on uh, uh, to the world of organization behind and so so one topic who would have offered that so was uh, covered by the dilemma uh, dynamic so that we could not refer to the organizational development kind of supervision so this and um and will there be another opportunity for somebody else to sit here and maybe bring an organization we we could use that and we have them to skip part of the program but it's important uh, we do um what i'm trying to do is to develop a professional culture and language that helps people in different fields of uh, professionality to use uh, these uh, concepts and approaches. It's not specifically organizational. We are specialized in organization. But the main thing is that the concepts are, st concepts are stated in a way that they are not longer bound to psychotherapy and to the tradition of TA but using all the good figures and insights and ideas of classical TA and modern TA uh, as a tool to make your own tools in your professional fields and to define your professionality besides psychological competence. That's my... And if this is coming across, then I, I have done a lot uh, for freeing Professional, professionality uh, from the ro histori historic roots of psychotherapy. And this is my contribution. And I think there is also a piece uh, for psychotherapists that I notice when I teach role theory to psychotherapists and they think about it, they're very excited and they use it in their yes. work and it's transformed. Yes, yeah. This is not against psychotherapy. It's against a habitual repetition of mm. classical thinking mm -hmm. in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Certainly, uh, it's, you can use all these concepts to make good society-oriented psychotherapy. Yeah. Mm. I think there's something very freeing about that for me. Mm -hmm. Much about whether I don't have the psychological background in mm -hmm. work, yes. Still, but um, I just it really does feel organizational, mm -hmm. and I can definitely see the potential mm -hmm. with clients in organizations. Okay, so you, you don't have any problems to to transform that in the organ into the organizational world you ca you're coming from, as long as the contract yes. is in place for that. Mm -hmm. You know the contracting that I do. Okay. Um, no, I think it, I think it's very powerful. I actually I'm kind of sitting here feeling we need we need <laughs> more of this type of work mm -hmm. in organisations. I don't think there's enough. Mm -hmm. There's too much ordinary ordinary stuff that we've been using for years. Is my view. Mm -hmm. But isn't that because organisations, just like psychotherapy, is often caught up in classical ways of thinking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the machine model of organisations mm -hmm. is still dominant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. We need your institute in English. <laughs> <laughs> you need to? We need your institute in English. Build it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. we, we give you any support we can. <laughs> That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, we want to, to spread what we developed wherever it can grow. We are, we are not interested to keep it. It's, it will die That's when right. it's kept. Yeah. Good. So I can go on. Can I share the tweet? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> so um, there's no such thing as a coincidence, remember. Um, a tweet came through from Deepak Chopra saying, Perception is different in different states of consciousness. Therefore, reality is different in different states of consciousness. <laughs> and that came through on my iPhone just after we did the talk around reality and dreams. And, yeah. and I thought that was just really interesting that it came through at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, from the perspective of Carl Gustav Jung, this is, you would call that a synchronicity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is um, coming together uh, realities out of very different worlds and there is no cause and effect connection, but a meaning connection. Mm -hmm. And he said, the meaning is organizing things between worlds without any classical understanding how these worlds affect each other. Mm -hmm. And I always liked that. Mm -hmm. He's just uh, written a book, I don't know if you've seen it, Leadership from the Soul. Mm -hmm. And it's lovely. It's really oh. touches a lot of what you're talking about. Okay. Well, and you're greater, of course. <laughs> 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 you know. yeah. uh. <laughs> this was this was part of uh, uh, of my of my script. Want to be the greatest, yeah. but uh, <laughs> some some I am fed up with it. <laughs> it's okay to be to, to give as a gift to others what I got as a gift because my specific talents. That's not my merit that I have them. My merit is that I uh, I nurtured them, and, and uh, but not that I have it. So, good. So I call this narrative TA. Somehow I feel obliged to tell everything TA so that we are sure it uh, belongs to our <laughs> world here. But uh, it's not wrong to call it TA. In, in, in German, uh, we have a, we, uh, a teacher who died, who was Leonhard Schlegel, and he uh, translated TA in Transaktionale Analyse. This means Anal analysis by transactions, not analysis of transactions. <laughs> and um, and this is a uh, TA in this understanding. I could agree very much too, be because it's always done by communication. Reality is created by communication, and we. Uh, w uh, and transaction analysis can be the approach to understand how reality is created through th through communication. Besides, and what concepts you use for that? That's a different question. So, and I call this uh, part just narrative TA. And um, I start... I, Ah, no, I, I want it. Because we have been with dreams, I first go with dreams. Achso, geht es dann aus, wenn ich dann... Ja. Ich hatte doch... Ich war doch an einem anderen Punkt. No. So. Uh, because we just had this dream conversation. I, I start first with... Uh, saying something more about dreams and then we go back to the intuition question and as you all know TA started with intuition mm -hmm. and it's an, one of the most important concepts in TA for me mm -hmm. so that's me uh, and interesting is that uh, it's a member of our groups who draw uh, this circus picture as a conclusion of how these two years of training have been for them. not And forgot this picture in the group room, not knowing that circus director is one of my mythological figures. <laughs> <laughs> and I already told you more about working with images. And uh, I've checked w uh, in the list of English articles, it's written about dreams, there's a lot about dreams, and it's also about uh, working with imagery. So it's already in English. If you, if you go for it on our website, you can just <coughs> download it and read it. And as we had in this conversation now, if you own, if you don't anything about Sandra, and uh, uh, not Sandra uh, about Lizzie, and you only. Here's this conversation. You have an image in your soul who Lisi is. Not in total, but in major parts of how she is as a human being. And it's so easy because it's so little 
technical information and still you have a very strong impression and image. And we usually do not use this enough consciously in professional work. And we do usually not have a communication culture because we always can be wrong or misleaded or projecting. In the, uh, and this is why we need a culture to exchange, to have different aspects, because in each relationship reality is different, as you <laughs> read to us. Uh, so reality is always a reality within relationships. And this is why it's necessary not, not to have too little a uh, too little amount of relationships, because the mirroring of who you can be then is too small. And uh, this is why we build up uh, a communication cultures within our training groups and also in working groups in organizations where people feel free just to come up with their images of what kind and talk to each other in a met metaphorical way, not uh, giving analytical descriptions, but also narrative description. Most people do this anyway, just spontaneously, but uh, it also needs to be trained and it needs to be included into a toolbox understanding of professionalism. And that's what I hope to further. It's not that I think the things are essentially new. Practically, many people do work like I offer. The problem is that we do not include it in our programmatic description of our professionality and a programmatic description of what TA is. Many people do good work in, in the TA field, and uh, the TA field gives permission just, um, if it's too narrow, put a house beside and fill it with what you want, and call it somehow TA, and that's okay. But if you are uh, ask what is TA, you talk about ego states, you talk about transactions, trauma, drag, and all that classical stuff, and we didn't manage up to now to change our way to describe our professional identity in a different way that is including and program uh, and programmatic uh, restructuring all these included uh, other ways of dealing with things. And from a point of uh, association, point of view of association building, I think that's a that's important to do, that we have a language of meta-professionality, how we talk about professionality that includes all these good experiences uh, people have and give a language to it and somehow sort it out and write it on our uh, labels. And we don't do that up to now. We always try. So we have the international conference on moving towards to uh, a future, keeping the tradition, building up new ones, things. They feel it's necessary, but the work is not really done. I always tell people from organizations, uh, when they ask me, why uh, why should I work with dreams? In my context, I, I cannot work with dreams. I say, yeah, it might be. It's not that you should do dream work with your organization. It's that you can study dream work and you can study it by telling meta metaphors or narrative figures of language to tune into intuitive levels of organization, of communication. And dreams are one way to deal with surreal ways of building up cre uh, reality and understanding meaning. So it expands your understanding on what is essential in creating reality. And it gives you some hints how you can uh, feel confident to work that way. Also, your clients might not use his methods in their context because the culture will not tolerate it. And we don't have to try that. It's okay when this person knows dream work could be quite good, but it's not okay to do that here, but still is in dialogue with its, his own intuition as if he would be prepared to do dream work. And this give, is, uh, uh, builds up a power field in which others 
are invited in to be sensible to their intuitive levels of organizing reality. So if I understand you right, it's not about being literal. No. So in a group, people spontaneously refer to non-conscious material, let's say. Yes. And we work with it. Yes. You don't have to call it a dream or call it... Yes. It just is. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. So, uh, what are the lessons we can learn from working with this narrative uh, ways of relating to reality? One is to learn to uh, be exempt from the laws of real world. Yeah. For example, in this uh, dream conversation we had, the point at which a decision is made it's not only that we now work on this decision on a horizontal level. The point is that this turns the scene to a new stage, to new dimensions of reality. This is something what in, in analytic reality doesn't happy, happen. That's, that's not the way uh, reality changes there. It's, and it's important to learn that these kind of changes may uh, indicate change uh, by learning on uh, by tolerating surreal expression of meaning and all the narrative uh, approaches help to uh, to understand meaning besides the logics of normal real world So, there is a surreal, they are surreal in character, means not non-real, made beyond classical reality. And <laughs> if you have a synchronicity phenomenon, it's not non-real, but it's, and it's not real in the usual understanding of reality, where things are tied together by cause and effect. It's surreal, and they are, can be related to each other by meaning. And uh, as you might have studied in the conversation on the dream, uh, it's not one meaning or one level on which things create meaning. Meaning usually is multi-layered, and you can explore with what other worlds and processes there could be a meaning relationship. And you certainly have uh, um, uh, ha developed habits, which worlds you put on your screen to understand how things go together. And the surreal world invites you to be open for new screens and to invite new greens, screens. Even so, the habitual description of reality of your client would not address these stages, but you can invite. So it also helps you to, to invite actively in experimenting with, with widening horizons. And, uh, and if you widen horizon, you help people to step back a bit of being hypnotized by, her, by their habitual reality. And so they feel more free to say, oh, there are so many options how things could go together and give meaning. Now I have to think about which of these reality options do I prefer are appropriate to the situation we have now and how to work uh, with that. So you really are responsible for your choices, for your way to create reality. And this is trained by all these surrealistic approaches. And if it works fine, even uh, our trainees never use the methods like dreams, metaphors, or storytelling. They realize that they could create stories and metaphors. And uh, some, many of them discover by training that they are able to do it. They didn't know that they know how to, how to do it. For example, storytelling. We... Uh, this is what came from the NLP, and um, 
we say, okay, you give a, uh, you offer an issue. The other person may uh, uh, designs patterns in that issue, then allowed transfer to some different world, animals, plants, st um, um, Märchen, fairies, fairy tales, or whatever, or comics, or whatever. and then transfers uh, some patterns into a different world and tells a story how this person did understand the issue uh, trans but, and you understand how you are you understood the issue by the way you transform it into a story on a different screen into a different world the translation process uh, makes clear how you understood it and say learn to construct a matching story so so far and then we invite people now uh, you can construct a leading story. If somehow you want to change on this other level, the story, what would you change? And so do it more analytically, think about how we can do that, and we say do it transparently, just listen, what does <laughs> my partner do with my issue? And what story drives he or she to translate it? And uh, where does my partner uh, start to change the story somehow. And the way we want, we try to change the story of our client is, is the implicit intuitive diagnosis what to add or what to change to make a richer world for my client. But I, my conscious mind doesn't know what my implicit diagnosis is. And by watching myself constructing the new story, I get ideas about what my implicated diagnosis is. And the other, because I do it transparently, the other person uh, can follow this process and be inspired by it and think, is that right or wrong? Oh no, that's a good idea. Some people are very good in constructing stories. Some people are not. Some people are good in telling stories. So they say, oh, nothing came to my mind when I tried to construct a story. That's okay, stuff just start telling your story. And some people are wonderful in, in telling a matching story and a leading story, and it's as if both of them listen. The one who is telling and the one uh, who is talked to. And then they talk about what happened, and so they both cooperate on a conscious and an unconscious level to create ideas about enriching reality. And some people are so good, and when they think about why am I so good, they say, oh, I have always told uh, stories to my children when I brought them to bed. I never had the idea that this is a competence I could use uh, for diagnosis or for creative dialogues in professional contexts. Or some others like me, uh, I'm not from a culture where we uh, work. I, I never read literature. I very seldom went to theater or what else. I don't know from where the richness of my language comes. But I discovered it's in me. The Jungian, Jungians might say it's uh, uh, not the individual, it's um, that's a individual, we, individual consciousness, but the common consciousness. The uh, collective, right, the collective con uh, unconsciousness. And it's so such a rich source to my life. And when I write, can write, that's my way to express myself. Um, I would have a hard time if I should miss it. So, and these narrative methods help you to integrate that and detect talents you never thought you had or you did not develop, or you did not include in your professional understanding. So you, you have split your world and your talents and just left that out, or, or only did it internally, but then there was no controlling communication with others. It's important for every intuitive work that it, it's also be controlled, because intuition always can be wrong. 
So we uh, also use uh, traditional ways of teaching. If you go into um, spirituality of all kind, what is really wise cannot be <laughs> said by al analytical in uh, analytical terms. It's always told in a narrative way by s telling stories of some kind. We laugh because it's the postman. Yeah. <laughs> the stereotype postman. The archetype postman. Oh, there you are. <laughs> and I'm a, a, a hypnotherapist, as I told you, have been. And I firmly believe that indirect suggest suggestion is enough when it's hitting. Yeah. You do not... And as a transaction, a suggestion means offering reality, uh, an idea about reality. That's a literal translation of suggestion. It's not catching somebody into your world. Mm. Bullseye yeah. transaction. Pun? Bullseye transaction. Mm, yeah, <laughs> if it's creative and open and not mm. hitting a person at one point and help him to get stuck, identified but get stuck. Yeah, no, my understanding of a bullseye transaction is not to go to a stuck place. It's a one Freeing. hits the right spot and yes, that was the idea. And also illustration in Burns' mm. interventions. Mm. Mm. So, uh, and I, when I was trained in transaction analysis, we learned, and I have trained a lot with Jackie Schiff. That's her personality uh, being as well. You have to um, address somebody, you have to build up a confrontation and not leave the person out until the, control, the confrontation is accepted. What might make much sense in the frame of reference she worked in. And so we learned never forget a question if asked, uh, identify every redefin redefinition in the answer and all these things and keep strict that somebody is reacting to your confrontations. And that's, has been, it, it came, uh, uh, it was interesting for me because I loved control. Teutonic control. And so TA gave me permission to be creative and then, uh, hit the other person with my reality. <laughs> Could you just say a little bit more about your experience of Jackie Schiff? Because there are not many people who have ever met her, and certainly mm. here, oh. it's all yeah. and, and yeah. there But are you know, stories. you know something about where she worked. All my children, she worked with Hepiphrenic. Mm. She built up a com community. Mm. She, she, she did up this reparenting thing, coming from the idea that it's an early developmental disturbance. Um, Hepiphrenia, schizophrenia, and, and, and character disorder things, and uh, it's it's no chance to change that on an adult organizing level. But you have to go back to the stages of development when it we went wrong, and really re-educate people. And they did it in a powerful way. They gave a safe surrounding that people could go into rage, they develop procedures to hold them that nobody is injured, uh, in, allowed them to be regressive and pathological under control, but requested to function on an adult level when, when it's not their turn. And one of the sentences Jackie Schiff said, uh, that your schizophrenic is not, a, uh, is not an excuse to misbehave yourself. And so <laughs> I like I like that somehow. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a switch between really um, having a okay, okay relationship to be disturbed, but also request not to use this as an excuse. Uh, I I took over that I like that. And say it worked because uh, with with high intensive procedures, uh, also with drug addicts. So. For example, the game, the synonym game, that was a procedure uh, they used uh, in, for drug addiction therapy and character disorder therapy. And so 
I learned a lot to enlarge my spectrum of how you can do psychotherapy. Uh, these high intensive procedures, I learned to tolerate them. It's not my personal preference. I'm an excitement diminisher. When I want to get essential, I get calm. And and she was bright, and she invited others to be bright and to think about how they conceptualize what they did. So she came up with a lot of interesting concepts in the Cassexis reader, uh, most of them put together. And as I told you, many of these concepts uh, I took over, but transformed them into a equal eye-level way of meeting reality and not uh, opposing a specific kind of therapeutic reality on heavily disturbed persons. Some of, as all these powerful psychotherapies, some of uh, the personality of Jackie and the culture she brought up also was tot totalitarian. And uh, I guess this is uh, the reason why she finally got into trouble, because they worked with methods uh, that was not, have not been covered by a, a legal rules in the United States, and they went to India, where it seemed to be more freer. And then somebody died in procedure, so there was an ethical I issue in the ITAA, and, as Mike Brown said, they cooked Jackie. Jackie was rebellious. That's part of her personality. Who is? She said one day, I will cure schizophrenic. So she was very st strong and brave. And certainly she did not give in when a committee, an ethic committee, wanted her to tell how she should behave or not behave. And that's how she was... Uh, kicked out uh, from the ITA association. And at that time, maybe there was a dynamic of, and, and this is very often in, in IT, the history of ITAA, that uh, people who have unconventional new ideas not really are respected and not really are integrated. I, I guess today we have problems with those who who are left maybe are, have a too narrow path of ITAA. Which is interesting given the origins of transactional analysis mm -hmm. and the fact that it was about being different, doing things differently, working away from the, the current system. Yeah, this has a lot to do also certainly with the experience of Eric Byrne, yeah. who was at the edge of the psychoanalytic movement. I've done a, um, a, in the 80s um, interviews with Fanita English, who told a lot about this. It's published in German, and the interviews have also been in German, so it's, I don't know how to, to make it available for you. But there are many books on that. Is that enough about Jackie? <laughs> Sheishif, one of her... Was she totalitarian? Was that your experience of her, her style? Yes. yes. I'm not saying she, at all. She she had a totalitarian root, and she made for many years an excellent cultural thing out of it, mm -hmm. but but never really worked through the rest of pathological part, and at the end. Uh, it went down because of that. That's my hypothesis. But this, this is no reason not to admire her work she did during the in the positive part, and we should really uh, uh, respect it and uh, develop it further. And was she actually thrown out, or was it that they some people wanted to throw her out? I don't she know. Wasn't in the end. I I haven't uh, I haven't been close to the. Um, I, I as far as I know, she she got an ultimatum to admit uh, and to adapt at least a bit, and she was stubborn enough not to do. So mm -hmm. is that being thrown out? They could have known that Jackie will not give in, and still made the ultimatum. 
So it's a dilemma, certainly, if there is an ethics committee and does not have any authority, that's not working for association too. But on the other hand, it was clear this means kicking her out. And many, re many received it, per perceived it that way, that it was on the underlying level a way to get rid of her. And she died quite tragically later on, mm -hmm. lonely. So, I was at the point, uh, suggestions. So, I really believe you don't, uh, in, the, in the sphere we normally work, but even if it's with heavily disturbed people, I always believe that the soul, if you tell the soul something that give, really is meaningful to the soul and gives hope and uh, support, then the soul will integrate it. And you don't have to say it in a way you should do it. It's totally enough to say this is a possibility. I learned that from storytelling in hypnotherapy. In hypnotherapy you never give a command to anybody. You say, it might be feel, feel comfortable, that. And if the organism is prepared enough to accept this comfortableness, the, just adopt the idea and feels comfortable to have it decided on his or her own. It's not only a trick not to lease report, it's also an attitude. As strong your invitations might be, they are still invitation. And always the other person should be free to adopt it or not. Otherwise it, it turns to be totalitarian or, colonial, or colonialistic. And, um, and it's also unnecessary to put power to a message uh, and risk your personal authority um, because when you are wrong, you lose your power and your authority. Uh, if an idea is really fitting and good from the perspective only of the client, not only for, uh, for your of your perspective, then uh, it has its power as an idea, as a notion, and you don't have to empower it extra. Sometimes it helps if somebody trusts you that you say, I could believe in this idea, and this is why I really recommend it to you. And when you ask me, you have the permission to do that, you, assi you are assigned to do that, and whatever, but never say, I tell you, this and that, because you bring, if it doesn't fit, uh, or the person wants to create reality on her own, uh, you bring the person in a dilemma. It doesn't fit really, it's something on it, but it's also not totally right. Uh, it might be right, but they do not want just to take over reality of other persons, they really want to create a, an own reality. And it's unnecessary to produce all these conflicts. If you have a working agreement, honestly, you do everything you can do and leave the other person to take whatever she or he wa wants to take. That's an attitude that I learned from hypnotherapy and indirect suggestions. And that we are, ha don't have to head for solutions all the time, to accompany somebody even through phases where there's no solution, uh, is okay as well. And if you create, uh, inspire a person to search for new horizons, that's sometimes enough. And sometimes, as we had it here, it's enough just to accompany a person as long as there is desert. And not, not getting uh, uneasy yourself and thinking, I'm not a good psychotherapist, well, I do not push somebody forward. But certainly you have to learn to, uh, to have to learn judgment, what the situation is. So, and this is why we need to exchange a lot on these things that your, the judgment are building up. And certainly the judgments somehow are related to the attitudes of the professional culture and association you are in. This is why we need to build up uh, qualities of a professional culture 
uh, because the personal training of judgment uh, is inevitably tied into the system relationships. So, when I work with streams, as you have seen, I, I hope, uh, the, I more study how the dreamer deals with metaphorical occurrences. Because this is an example, the person relates to reality and creates reality. And so we can use this as understanding how the person uh, deals with experiences in the real world. But all, all experiences in the real world are also surrealistic experiences. You all know situations where you have in a conflict uh, two or three partners telling you what happened. You wouldn't believe that they have been on the same stage. And there's no way to find out which story you would ad adopt more. So, isn't that the reality is surreal. It's o it only has an obvious real part, but the real part doesn't make the story. And it's not the level on which you can uh, go for progress. So, what I, for example, in dream work, what I sometimes do to train people to understand the surrealistic understanding of situations is, if this were a dream, how would you interpret it? And so they dare to, to, to tune into the surreal world and finding meaning in that. So, and for me, it does not make a matter much whether you work with dreams, storytelling, metaphors, or images just coming up. Out is all of the, of the same sphere. It's it, some. It's not necessary that it's a night dream, or it's an unconscious picture. If somebody is producing a more or less conscious picture, why not? Um, Fritz Perls once said, uh, "One of the most difficult things is to see the obvious." <laughs> people are constantly telling themselves and their way to deal with reality. It's inevitable. It's only that we we need to, to to learn to see it. It's not that it's hidden. And so the the aim of all work with narrative methods is. Uh, to make reality spheres permeable and to invite into a sensible communication culture on background without pulling background into foreground. This doesn't have to be the case. This, and background is not habitually psychological level related to childhood. Backgrounds may be very of very different kind. Yeah. And so it's not dream interpretation that is classic in the first place, sometimes it is, but not habitually. But dealing with dream experiences and contexts and experimenting with creative dialogues on that in order to understand how the person tends to create reality. <coughs> and on one of these levels, to give some hints how this can be clarified or transformed or developed further. So, the inner part of that onion is what's going on in the dream. But you are not in the dream. You, you never know. The if dream work means to meet a person telling what the person thinks she had dreamt. So there is interpretation in between, there is style of 
remembering in between, which is all also um, uh, uh, shaped by interpretation, and there is context to it. Because if a person tells you something, there is it's tell uh, it's a telling in a context, and how we and maybe the story that is told you is not so interesting as how what is a person doing in this context by telling a dream. Hmm? And for example, in 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 our work uh, with Lisi, one part what she told me afterwards privately is, for me it was very important to dare to sit there. And when we remember the top, the, the issues of the dream on a process level, this is already part of the solution of the developing further. And so sometimes, even when I call for dream work, we do not talk uh, at all about the dream. We have to find out which of these, all these levels might be a moment, in the moment, the most useful to create a developing story. And we do not only create that story from, uh, come, starting from the dream or the memory or the telling of the dream. If we some kind of, uh, develop some kind of idea and picture, uh, then we just compare it with worlds. So we go back with the helicopter and say, okay, we have now talked about um, the stage called dream and the stages around called remembering, tol- called telling, called creating reality and the context. And we found some patterns, some ideas about this. Uh, if we now compare it to other stages, other roles, other plays and so on, what are there parallels and what can we learn from that? Because in the end, from an economical point of view, we have to do a kind of work that is useful for many stages and many worlds and, and many roles. And if it's only a thing that is quite isolated, it's a, it's a question whether we should do that work. We can, we always can do something meaningful. But we also have to decide if we only have one hour, what is the most effective and more is most essential. And it's not this question is not answered by doing anything emotionally touching. So and and all this uh, changes attitudes to reality and uh, to encounter of reality when people meet. It's, it's uh, always a mixture. What, what comes out as a common shared story then is a mixture of the dreamer's world of experience and the dialogue partner's work, world of associations and experience. And this is why I say it's, it's unique because it's a co-creative reality of two cultures that meet. And if another culture meets one of these cultures, a different common shared culture and story is coming out of that. And that's not because the first one was not valid. It is because in another context, the reality is different. And uh, in it writes in uh, from a classical psychoanalytic uh, view, uh, dreams Sigmund Freud, nineteen hundred. Uh, it is just staying with the content and the process of the dream and analyze it. And I invite into being creative with change orchestration. Find out. If we would rearrange the dream, or if we would not look, as you always do, at the point where you are scared, but if you would look at the, what happens afterwards, what I, as an observer, think, oh, she was scared to death, but what happened in the dream afterwards was not, was not dangerous. How come this person is always stuck, hypnotized, by the moment of being scared and 
mixing that up with being in danger. So we experiment with with change of focus. Let's say your um, dream started after the point where have you, you have been scared to death. How would you analyze then what happened? Is there any scare? So how come that you think your scare is announcing something very dangerous and you do not realize that the dangerous thing is not happening, not even in your dream? So you have an habitual fixation on scare. And then if you want, then you can work with a record concept on that or whatever. Or what I also did uh, is in just experimentally introduce new figures. Uh, and the, I, I talked to you about the coaching of uh, an HR manager uh, who was not sure whether he could stand this higher position. And he dreamt like situation, I have to give a speech and there have been four men who are judging me and one of them has uh, gloves from boxing hanging at his stool and he was totally scared. And I just experimented with, I could have worked through the scare with him and what he has to do with a not present father and all these things. But instead said, how about we put them down on your level and behind you. And now let's experiment that they are there to protect you. How does that feel? And I said, oh, the boxing gloves. You, is that a sign for you that there's a person who wants to put you down? In my understanding, a box, boxing glove is that men can fight with each other to to get stronger without hurting each other. Oh, I never thought about this. And so, so we rearranged meaning, chain stories, uh, frame of references, and he felt uh, good in having men behind him. And uh, so we reorchestrated the dream. And certainly you can ask your client, have your idea, how to do it. And when the client has good ideas, work with that. Certainly this is client-centered. But sometimes the client doesn't have. And then it's good when the consultant uh, has ideas, can be creative and offers options to find out. Not with the idea it must be correct, but with the idea um, this is my service and pick whatever you can make use of it. And in this case, uh, shortly after, we, we have had a, again a presentation in a part of the company where they discussed whether he could be uh, the manager of, of their department. And he was, uh, he, in the presentation before, he was totally stuck. And this time, he felt different. And then he dreamt that he's on a stage and there these men have been not there, but he felt confidence in, and the audience has changed. Before there have been men looking very stern at him, and now there have been men and women and children, and it was a, a rich, a playful situation, and so on. And so we together invent new stories um, that create on all levels new attitudes, understandings, behaviors, feelings, without relating that this to uh, develop, uh, without habitually relating this to history and to biography. And you can really do psychotherapeutically meaningful work without adopting ideas and methods of psychotherapy. And as I showed you, all, it's it's also good with this helicopter metaphor to feel free just to uh, to experiment with combinations of frame of references and uh, elements of dream and contexts. And wherever you you come to a point, you find oh, this is a essential new way to do it. Then you just go on telling the stories.
and connect it to other parts. So it's a very, uh, it's art. It's shared professional art. It sounds to me like that in the in the creative encounter space in between you and the client. Yes. You're you're working with unconscious and non-conscious material, which may appear through dream, metaphor, right, whatever it happens to be. Yes. And you're going on a journey with the client right. to explore what exists and what's significant. Yes. And the way you're doing it is by expanding into other worlds, other stages, other contexts, and looking for meaning, yeah. rather than looking for a linear explanation from point A to, yes. to now. Right. And the key issue seems to be to me that you're part of that unfolding narrative. Right. You don't have a fixed narrative as the as the therapist or whatever, you're right. also in the story. So you're both creating a new story. Yeah. So to me, this sounds like your model of working relationally and co-creatively. Right. Oh, a wonderful words you have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry that I could not explain it to you in this wonderful world. I could see your diagram while you were talking, and I could, I could. Yes. So I just wanted to check. Yes. And it's not only creative in the sense of enlarging; it's also creative in finding out where you should have to be more precise. For example, how, how to deal with language. So that's, that we do not go into creative is just having all kind of interesting ideas. It's combined with solid handcrafts work of communication. So you're creating a kind of shared language together. Yes. yes. And I study the, the, the style, the reality creating style of the other person while co-creating with me reality. And look whether I think there should be there's a limitation or it's not adequately used in creating reality, and so I give uh, inspiration on that level too. It feels a little to me like constellating and mapping. Yes. While using images and right. ideas and thoughts, as opposed to objects or people. Right. So. Now I, I go back to the big, can you, can we go on with the, also the question of intuition? Mm -hmm. We have implicitly talked a lot about that now. So it's on intuition now. Who of you knows McCormick's book, Intuition and TA? Mm -hmm. It's not, not coming. I will get no. the copy down. Yeah. So these are the um, um, articles of Eric Byrne, starting with 1949, I guess up to 62. 62. Yes, yeah, 62. You can buy it on Amazon. Uh, second hand oh, only. Okay, yeah. And uh, this is this was a hundred dollars. Wow. You can buy it for twenty. Mm -hmm. which apparently it's in bad condition. Mm -hmm. I thought it was sixty dollars. This yeah. You uh, you don't have to read it in origin in original because it's also following all the steps of the beginning and much of the essentials of it uh, are you can read for example in my articles uh, what I adopted what I found for our field useful and developed it first and I will present that to you but if you want to understand more about the origins of TA this is a wonderful full book to read And this, make, this makes clear, and you can follow how Eric Byrne developed TA concepts as manifestation of his own intuitions in therapeutic situations. And I told you that one of the figures that is in the very beginning, there is a lawyer, and he imaged a young, a little boy behind him, and he started to put that into circles. And this was so the way he started to uh, uh, in the direction of ego states but it, it took 
some years until the ego states model was developed from that. But never forget, uh, you are Eric Byrne today. Yeah? And you, sh you should not beware the ashes, but uh, be light by the fire of daring to work with your intuition and making out concepts if there are intu intuitions that are useful for others as a tool, always being aware that it's a map, it's a tool, it's a way to share intuitions and it's not a, rea not a description of reality of human being. That's easy to say when you're 65 and you have as many years experience in TA yeah. As you do. <laughs> you will be 65 one day as well. I will. <laughs> Get on your way. <laughs> so, and certainly from a systemic point of view, uh, the world Burn and others created has been the world of psychotherapy at that time in this country. And so he was in the stream of defining psychotherapy as a, as a method looking for motivation. And if the consciously told motivations doesn't fit to your hypothesis, you adopt the notion of unconscious motivations. And uh, of biography of limiting life plans and enacting past drama today because something is is not uh, does not meet your developmental need and all these classical psychologies, even the Gestalt, they say it's an unclosed Gestalt, something in your development did not come to a, a peaceful, fruitful point and this is why you over and over again try to make that happen, but because you reproduce the situation in which it uh, failed, you offer the failure when you offer your need. And this was the basic idea of psychotherapy, and this is how, and then we should find out how what we, what is presented right now in script behavior and in games and so on is a reenacting of problematic situation in childhood and if we become aware of that but it's not only making conscious what psychoanalysis thought but it's all working through somehow being emo emotionally touched that changed on a deeper level my orientation to the frame of reference then this is psychotherapy and it was uh, the, the first definition of the uh, script from Eric Burns was transference drama. So it was a very classical psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis. Eric Byrne, uh, you know about the, the first studies of, um, of uh, intuition of Eric Byrne? He was in the, by the military and many naked men passed by and he, because it was so boring, he guessed about their professions and so found out that he was uh, much more often right than he expected. And so he said, oh, there's a kind of perception. We don't know how we know it, but we know more than we think that we know it. And so this was the ori origin of working with intuitions. And the definition of Byrne, and he related to Aristotle, uh, by said is intuition is the way we know something without knowing without knowing how we know and I guess we never will know how we know even brain research will not help much that we just can leave it open how we know uh, but what we very often do not know as well is what we know but we act on it as if we knew. And by being aware of how we are acting, we can 
conclude the ideas we intuitively adopted. And this is then called social diagnosis. I try to understand in what reality scenery uh, I tune in in contact with a specific client and what does this say about my intuitive ideas about the world of this client. So that without, know, without consciously knowing, I co-interact within the scenery the client is offering me. And by studying together this scenery, we both have a study group to understand uh, on a conscious level as well what intuitively is enacted by us. And certainly it's good to know what my tendencies to create realities are, so that I can be quite sure that what I'm tuning into is I, I'm uh, playing with the other. I'm, it's also at that moment also my reality because I, I go with it. But it's not coming out of my, my system of realities. It's because I'm resonating to the client. And then we both can study what that is and thus find a way to study the client's ways to create realities. And I notice that it's possible that it is the other way around with many psychotherapists and coaches. So actually the client is tuned into is to their reality, the therapist's reality, the coach's reality. Yeah, and, th and that's okay too. As, as long as we check whether it's a, a fruitful way for the client. Mm -hmm. I suspect neither are aware. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I always say it's not a shame, uh, to entire your clients into your stories as long as your stories help to develop the stories of your client. You don't have to be neutral. It's, it's boring to be neutral. It's not you then. And if you, if you don't assume that you are not neutral, everything is coming from the clients and you are not ready to analyze what your parts are in the co-creation. And as I said before, uh, the metaphorical work helps you to adopt the, the attitude that is just natural, that is a mixture of both realities. And we together can find out how this can be a positive mixture. Uh, and this, for me, doesn't go along with a one-up, one-down analytic uh, relationship in psychotherapy or consulting. So this is, uh, was the definition of burn. And I thought about... Uh, what is the evolutionary function of intuition and an image came to my mind you our ancient was drinking at the lake or at the spring and looks up and says what did I take a wolf this time yeah or a bear or whatever and immediately from very different levels of reality informations have been uh, put together to come to a decision by doing, because there's no time to think about. So what intuition helps you is to be very compositive of many worlds, even surrealistic worlds. It, it, it gets close to this surrealistic understanding of reality, putting everything together and leading immediately into a behavioral And hopefully you will survive them, otherwise you will not be part of the theory. <laughs> and certainly it's no chance to compute at all. And this is true in complex situations anyway, also today. It's always on so many levels much too much that it's impossible to compute it consciously. And you act on your impressions before you understand you, that you have adopted realities or selected realities. But what you can do is in doing this dialogue, and this is a dialogue of communication for, 
learn to train your intuition. So which kind of intuitions are good, are adequate for a professional role? When I'm here to, um, to, to supervision, also this woman might be very pretty. My intuition should not be busy with how can I get her into my bed. <laughs> also, evolutionary sits may be reasonable and quite understandable. So it's not natural. I have to be trained to learn which kind of realities my intuition should be attentive for. And for many intuitions, because intuition is a judgment about reality, you need to be knowledgeable. You cannot judge without knowing these worlds. So, into uh, Intuition must be trained, it's not a natural thing. It must be focused, it must be directed, it must be connected with roles, with contexts. And this is a way we could say what we do in training. And certainly, uh, and... Um, so you're saying intuition, you have to have A2 alongside A1, it's not enough. Uh, yeah, I usually, yeah, I, I, I do not, I, I think it's just wrong to put intuition either in A, A2 or in uh, and the little professor or things like that. I, it doesn't make much sense to me uh, to, to put it into the ego state model. Because the de my definition uh, is uh, intuition is a judgment about reality. And all all the ego states or parts of your personality that are activated to judge are, certain, uh, are certainly involved in intuition. And there's a second question whether you want to find out whether this is a, a parental source of judging or a childhood source or whether it's connected to wanting to play or being scared or whatever. These are secondary questions. You only adapt if they make a difference for what you want to do right now. I would not do that habitually. And I, I think you, you will not get, uh, it's, you will not be clever if you can put it in a circle. Well, I guess the response of the intuition may then be integrated into any first day. Depends you on the feeling or the thought that goes with the response to yeah. the intuition. Um, you, you talk as if A2 is something. Mm -hmm. This is, you go, you go back into um, sub, uh, objectifying mental constructs. I would state the same sentence differently. I would say, uh, you, integra you integrate these intuitions in your uh, way of professionally functioning, and you can describe that with ego states mm -hmm. if this description says you something you don't know and already. Mm -hmm. that's, so. that's what I was thinking about. My understanding of adult is is my capacity as a human being to engage in the here and now mm. with aspects of reality yeah. and make meaning of them in order to make here and now contextual decisions, action, whatever, relationship, yes. however that is. So it wasn't a kind of mechanistic I to um, yeah, I to application of I, totally I see adult as a metaphor for that, yes. if you like. I totally agree with what you are saying. For me, to call that adult is 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 so narrow and misunderstanding. I would just not use the word for that. You, I understand much better when you s tell me what you mean with that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Which is why Keith went with that model yes. and the intuition mm -hmm. being there yes. and went back to calling it neo Yes. Uh -huh. So that links back to what you were saying earlier is it's not enough just to label something. You yes. So then unpack. Yeah, um, yes. Beethoven said lab labeling is a pacifier. Mm. It gives you the <laughs> feeling you know something, but it doesn't explain anything. <laughs> uh, 
And diagnosis is making a difference that make a difference. And you cannot uh, decide what a diagnosis is without defining what differences you want to make. And this is uh, the, the diagnosing is, is the second step or uh, um, after you are trying, you have get an idea what difference you could make. And with, if, with that idea, you make diagnosis in the sense of understanding which differences make a difference to produce that difference in reality that you are trying to work. Uh, to do. Is this difficult? Do you understand this? No. Okay. Uh, information, that's uh, Beta's notion, is a difference that makes a difference. So, information has always to do with meaning. And information is always contextual. There are people who have ideas about the world and want to do something in that world. So, um, they, in order to control themselves, not only pacifying, but saying, oh, no, I know what things are, to control them, say, themselves uh, during experimenting with reality, they have to f uh, uh, um, develop an idea what would make a difference that makes a difference for what I want to reach. And this difference is called diagnosis. You know it's a word from clinical work from differential diagnosis. If you come to the one conclusion you will do something else as if you come to the other conclusion. If you have a long discussion on diagnosis and the end is always haloperidol, that's pacifying. It no, has nothing to do with diagnosis, it's only labeling because it doesn't make a difference in treatment. And so, diag diagnosis always uh, has to be argued uh, from the frame of reference, how does this help to come to a better reality? Otherwise, it's just patho pathological labeling and creates also a, a culture. So, Byrne said, uh, uh, we come to that later, but the, the assumption was intuition is always selfish. It's even going into the theory of genes, the selfish gene. And this was a frame of reference, they stated the nature of humans in evolution. But there are new uh, notions to that, they say, um, evolution is cooperation from the beginning. It was, uh, it was a, a limited un, uh, assumption that evolution is based on being selfish. So it's not so difficult uh, to uh, be motivated to use your intuition for cooperation, for example, for a study group in doing a conversation. It's not that I have to find out how not to be selfish to exploit my client. That's a an, um, perspective we should be aware of, and I, I come to this later, but it's also natural just really uh, to want to be cooperative. Byrne was with a question, what can we do that a person, let's say a psychotherapist, is free to use his intuition for others? He, he believed in the selfish idea. And two sources of limitations, uh, I will come to that later, are taboos, I do not dare, I, I, I have to be free not to accept taboos, this helps me to free my own tuition, and I have should not have undetected desires I do not take care of. And then the question, is it possible only to refer to others? I already said no. It's always, we refer to the co-creative reality 
we produce together. Still, if I'm well trained to differentiate this from my own habits of creating reality, I have an idea what is coming from my client. But what we do with that is our shared co-creative production of reality. So it's okay to tell your own story and live your own myths in professional work. Only be aware of is it adequate also to be a service for the other person. So I opened up the definition of intuition. Intuition is a judgment about reality. I already, already talked to that. This means intuition is not located in one part of the personality. It's connected with with all parts of the personality which are involved in judging reality. It can be qualified or unqualified and it can lead you or mislead you. So, I, maybe it's gone now, but for some time people had the romantic idea, if you free intuition, then you are competent, and intuition then is right. That's nonsense. Intuition is just the, po the um, competence to judge on an unconscious level. And you need all the qualifications to judge, certainly also on an unconscious level. So it has to be trained and educated. And certainly in different worlds uh, there are different um, criteria for qualification of intuition. I think that idea is still around in TA a lot. Mm -hmm. About just free your intuition, allow your child, yes. and all is well. Yeah. And judge and judgment is a word which is almost taboo yeah. within TA yeah. and is seen as parental and critical. Yeah. And so we are in a trap with some of the con the ways of thinking produce attitudes. And this is why we need a different way of thinking and also different words. And to be fair to Byrne, he didn't say that. Byrne writes about judgment mm -hmm. and the importance yes. of judgment. Yeah. But somehow in his in the way probably because he died so young, the way his words were then taken and transformed and right. set in stone. Right. Yeah. I was having a conversation the other day with someone about judgment, and they made the statement, judgment is bad. Yeah. And I said, how ironic that that's a judgment in itself. Yeah. And to me, judgment is simply a decision on where that judgment comes from. A bit like a hammer. A hammer is nothing. Mm. It, it's not by, neither good nor bad. Right. How you use it yes. might be good or bad. Yes. So where the judgment comes from, yes. maybe good or bad, or how you use that judgment, yes. maybe good or bad. Judgment is neither here nor there. Yes, and you are lucky when you do not only have a hammer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Judgment is, an, is something essential to be alive. It's a decision. Yeah. Certainly. It's a choice. Yes. For me it's <laughs> no question. <laughs> I cannot, I sometimes just cannot understand how people can tell such a nonsense. Well, it's a judgment on judgments, which is ironic. Yeah. Hmm. So I, I don't have to uh, go on with that. I said it already. It's context-bound, it's mm -hmm. sphere-bound, it has to be trained. It's different in different spheres and roles and contexts. We can combine that with all, that all with the theater metaphor and else the other concepts. Uh, Burns' intuition uh, is only one half of intuition. He is directed to an intuition of the present. The so perception of, uh, and especially in the psychotherapeutic context, the perception of represented archaic realities. That's what clinicals in TA are trained on. If I see you acting, I get images at what age, in what context, was played on another stage the story we are re enacting here now. And that's one way you can become really competent. The only point is you should not believe that that's the truth. 
that is one way to create a story to the story is, that is just happening. But it's not clear whether this is a story you need to, do your, to get your work done. You can create many other stories. This intuition is directed to what is there or what was there and is reenacted right now here. And Carl Gustav Jung uh, referred to another part of intuition. Intuition is uh, being sensible for the possible future. The anticipation of possible realities. How, what could be real instead of what I meet right now? So this is the part you need for creative work creative work. And Jung postulated uh, that you have a function in your fold that is somehow able, if trained, it also has to be trained, but it's somehow able to have an idea of what, uh, which of the many, many possible futures are really possible one for this person you're sitting uh, uh, together with. So it's not just being creative and thinking of anything. It is a, a function of the soul of understanding what this person, this organization, this uh, professional development could be one day. And then offering what you imagine. And sometimes it's, it's so mind-blowing for the other person because the soul at once says, yes, that fits me. Also, I never had the idea I could be that. So you create an image that will immediately be stored as an option uh, for the future. It's a perception of the potential. We, in, a, in our classical scientific uh, description of the world, uh, we, can, we, we do not have a category for this. But Jung postulated that in his model. Also say that that the intuition that we have with the client in a specific situation also uh, uh, forces our perception to a certain direction, so that um, totally. that we exclude rest of the thing, yeah. things that are coming in. Yeah, we just follow the one one thing. Yes. When, whenever, whenever you let a story evolve, you are neglecting all other possible stories that could have evolved at the same time. And, and that's life. And you should do it in a responsible way. Always knowing that this story is not the right one. It's the one you chose up to now. And you can change it any time when you find out it's not really good. So I don't want to go into that. Uh, this is a, a Jungian understanding of the person. Uh, many of you know this in a more technical form as MPTI. MPTI. What is it? MPTI. And Jung made a mistake, I believe, a theoretical mistake, naming. Uh, intuition of the possible, just intuition. Because when the definition is correct, that intuition is an unconscious judgment about reality, it's not only one way to, uh, to judge about reality, but it's also thinking, it's also experiencing, and it's also valuing. So we should not, it's a mixed up of categories, logical categories. <coughs> I call, just called it uh, intuition of the possible. Uh, a famous uh, Swiss pupil of Carl Gustav Jung, Marie-Louise von Franz, she said, intuition, das ist die Nase für das Mögliche. This means, that's the nose for what could be. So, Byrne said, uh, we need to free our intuition, that the client can have a profit of it. And there are limitations to this screen. And one is taboos. I'm not allowed to deal with certain aspects of reality. And this is why 
in my judgment about reality and my perceptions and my contribution to stories, I leave things out that should be included. So this is uh, personal work uh, to know, at least know your taboos. And he said you should be aware of your desires and fear. If you think you are so generous and you do not take any fee, then the danger is high that you exploit your client to get anything despite the money, uh, as an exchange for the money. So you should be clear about your desires. And either find ways to satisfy your desires in the work, or being aware or make sure that your desires are satisfied enough in other worlds and other roles that you can uh, then you are not do not need to satisfy these desires in your work and certainly you will have a friendly attitude to your desires when you find it's okay even each desire is okay but It needs to be transformed, that it's fitting to the role, fitting to the context, fitting to the task and the ethical standards of your association. But there are more limitations, which Berndt, now not Bern, uh, stated. I think the most important uh, limitations are fixations and habits. And many of them are trained professionally. You are trained into habits. The fixation, if if I feel uncomfortable, this is a a transference problem, you are in acting uh, uh, interaction situation of history, and I'm fixated in going along uh, this chain. So it's important that an association knows how uh, Uh, the association invites people into specific fixations and and intuitive habits. It's okay to have habits, but it's also necessary to know that these are habits and not the only way to really be human and do it. And very often limitation to intuition is lack of competence and knowledge. As I told you, Judgment about reality depends on experience. And the brain research says um, you really need knowledge in order to learn in the area of knowledge. The idea that there is transfer between very different eras is not very good. For example, I was told you learn Latin because Latin teaches you how to think. The modern Neuro research says uh, I should be taught to think in the eras that are important to me because learning Latin doesn't give me a transfer to these areas. It's really context bound. So we need to have enough competence and knowledge. And very often I have the problem with psychotherapists coming in our training that they think they do not need the knowledge in the organizational field. And they have to. And another limitation to intuition is when the experimental flow is blocked. As I demonstrated here, it's okay to just start somewhere and be curious and uh, going on, be experimental. And the uh, security is not coming from Uh, staying in predefined limits, the security is coming from being aware of how you are creating. And if you feel blocked that you are not allowed to do so or whatever, uh, then that's a limitation to your intuition. And it's also a lack of tuning into each other's spirit. If you is if you're not in a in, in a culture where you learn to to see the world from the perspective of your partner 
and really respect it and 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 respect the spirit what this person wants to be in life uh, but more be oriented how can I teach this person what I learned in life and what's important to me then your intuition your helpful intuition for developing this person is limited and it's also limited if you don't have ideas and creative designs for future realities so I um, when somebody is coming to meet the supervision for an organizational process I ask the person do you have any idea if you could have all leverages and all resources how the future you want to build up with them could look like and if they don't have idea about that I don't know how how they can orient themselves in supervision. They only can find flaws, mistakes, and point to them and do confrontation work. But this is fruitless when it's not directed to something to achieve, really. <coughs> so, the dialogue model says the most creative potential is in intuition and certainly the better intuition is trained the more and on the other hand we need a a surface that makes gives us a secure procedures so that that is not somehow obscure some hypnotherapists uh, as I said already love to say it may not make sense to you now but somehow later you will know and and so it's mystifications, uh, foggy things. Uh, I would not be satisfied with that. I, I, belie- I, I believe in things like this, but only if I'm sure that this person uh, has a good dialogue within herself between scientific approach and these spheres. And even Jung in the beginning said, and you have this with Castaneda as well, Creativity is not falling into the world of intuition, of, of untrained intuition. Creativity is staying at the bridge, be, uh, at the border between the worlds and always dialoguing. Each sphere being a corrective for the other sphere. That's creativity. And that leads to development. So we need scientific methods, that means methods of clear thinking, of meta perspectives, thinking about what we are doing, this does not mean reading books, uh, doing statistics, scientific methods, that's a, a systematic way of thinking, that's science, about reality and experimenting with reality, that's science. So this offers us more security and but it's very limited in what we can do at once and so we need intuition which opens up more options and say together are the mutual basis for creative action. So that was intuition, and we are ready for having a lunch break. Are there any questions before or comments? Was this too long? No, it was pretty, I thought it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. It was interesting enough to 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 hold on even if it's long. No, I. I it just, I don't know, it just seems like it's not something I've ever explored before. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm very much someone who goes on gut instinct. Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting. Good. So how long do will we do our lunch break today? Maybe one hour, not one too hour. long? One hour? Mm-hmm. Or, or yeah. one hour? It's interesting that we're debating between one or one and a half hours and not 45 minutes. (laughs) (laughs) So let's meet again at half past one.